So good afternoon, everybody. Today is Thursday, the 7th of May, 2020. And uh, for those that uh, haven't met me before, my name is Jonathan Wu. I'm the Chief Investment Specialist for Cream China Funds Management based here in Sydney. Um, and today I'm really privileged to have Gordon Yip, who is the Chief Investment Officer of Valley Partners Fixed Income Team. So Gordon uh, has extensive experience with, with, uh, with fixed income markets, being over 20 years in the industry. Um, and he has actually been with Valley Partners since 2009 in the capacity as a fund manager within fixed income. And then over time, he's been promoted to senior fund manager, investment director. And finally, in July 2017, he was promoted to chief investment officer uh, of Valley Partners fixed income team. So they manage in excess of five billion US dollars in terms of um, Asian and emerging market credit. And the local fund that we refer to here is the Premier Asia Income Fund, which had its inception in 2011 has, and has generated for investors over 10% uh, net of fees total return to clients per, per year uh, with a 6% distributable income uh, per annum paid on a quarterly basis. So we have over 30 observable periods um, of seeing distributions out to clients on that quarterly basis and there hasn't been ever a single distribution that has been less than 150 basis points. Um, so Gordon, uh, thanks for joining us on the call today. Thank you, Jonathan. So Gordon, kicking right off, in the context of investing in corporate bonds as advisors and therefore our investors, one of the key um, issues for us is to ensure that the money that we invest into a bond we get the money back at the end of uh, at the end of the period or in maturity. As we understand it, as part of your investment process, you ignore um, Western research houses um, because you believe that your credit process can add value. Um, can you sort of give us an idea of that um, and you know how important it is for investors to get capital back? Okay. Yeah. Sure, uh, Jonathan. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, when it comes to investing in corporate bond or so-called credits. Uh, they are really two very important things that investors need to consider. Now, number one is to look at the issuer's ability to repay, uh, meaning whether they have the financial ability to service their periodic coupons, as well as when the debt comes due, whether do they have the financial capability to repay the principal. And number two is the issuer willingness to repay. Okay. Uh, to get a sense of an issuer's ability to repay, we need to look at basically their balance sheet as well as study their business conditions. Now, uh, for example, we need to know uh, the company's cash positions. We need to know their plans on their capital expenditure. Um, obviously, we need to know how much debt they have and you know, when they are due and also uh, you know, what are they paying uh, for those debts. Uh, we also want to like to know whether they have any uh, important banking relationship, um, obviously their profit margin and their business model, et cetera, et cetera. So all these, uh, uh, we can get a good sense of their current liquidity and leverage situation. And from there, you know, uh, and also uh, get a sense of how all these will likely change in the future. With all these together, you know, uh, if you do your homework right, you know, uh, you know, we will help us tremendously in our, our investment process to determine, you know, if, if we like or dislike a, a, a bond, and if we like it, how much to own it, and also uh, help us to determine our entry and exit uh, level for these positions. Mm. Great summary. Um, I mean, th there's been obviously very vast impacts of COVID-19 on, on global credit markets. Um, how has it impacted what you invest in and what are the opportunities that you see? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the March sell-off uh, due to uh, the uh, coincidence of uh, COVID-19 as well as the uh, dramatic collapse in, in oil prices has created extreme dislocation in March. Uh, uh, throughout my you know, many, many years of uh, 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 experience as an investment manager, you know, this was by far the worst moment uh, you know, in my entire career, you know, arguably speaking, worse than Lehman Brothers. Uh, to me, it, it feels like the entire Lehman Brothers got collapsed into just two, three days. Okay, this is how bad it, it was. Uh, so, so look at the situation right now. Uh, you know, arguably, China has emerged uh, from the pandemic, and its economy has restarted. 
and its activities well, will gradually go back to sort of more normal level. So um, therefore, uh, we think the Asian credit market provides investor a you know, pretty good risk reward propositions. Uh, and in particular, we think uh, Chinese credit looks you know, very attractive from a relative value standpoint. I mean, how do you, I mean, there's, there's a lot of advisors that, that have, we've engaged with over the longer term about this strategy. And one of the things that we always talk about is that difference between the cash yield and the yield to maturity, because as a value investor, um, what you guys do are trying to find those undervalued or underloved bonds um, in the market, which are under-researched and allows you to pick up capital, some form of capital upside without uh, much risk, given the fact that you guys have done um, such in-depth fundamental credit research. Um, right now, you know, that opportunity seems to have um, arisen again, which, you know, it's probably the, the third or fourth time from memory that it has over the nine year period. So in light of that, how do you see the opportunity set that, that you're looking at for our portfolio? Um, the opportunity set of what you may want to invest in because you, you've, you've obviously raised a bit of cash in the portfolio, um, sort of around sort of 15% um, in recent times. And, you know, how does that compare to develop market opportunities? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the yield spread between, uh, for example, uh, China investment grade bonds uh, and versus those comparable US investment grade bonds, for example, uh, currently uh, that yield spread is uh, sitting around 160 basis point or 1.6%. Uh, that's uh, the widest level uh, in the past five years, okay? And the average uh, around the past five years uh, is around 80 basis point or 0.8%. So if you look at 1.6 versus 0.8%, right now we are essentially, you know, uh, currently at uh, two times of the historical average of, for the past five years. So the yield differential is actually is the widest uh, at, at the moment. And for the high yield universe, again, the yield differential between China high yield versus uh, US high yield, uh, averaging around 1.3% for the past five years. Right now, we are at 2.8. So arguably, we are actually more than two times from, from the five-year historical average. So that's the number, right? But on a more realistic basis, you know, as I mentioned, you know, China uh, is the first country to emerge from COVID-19. And uh, again, the, the economy has already started. Uh, hopefully, we'll gain back to a, a high percentage of the normal level uh, pretty soon. Uh, however, many developed countries, they are still trying to, you know, control the pandemic right now. Uh, in some countries, actually, you know, we have no sight of where the peak is in terms of the confirmed cases. So uh, if you compare the reality versus what the market is trading right now, uh, we believe right now uh, China credit, uh, you know, the, the, the level that we are at right now, uh, does not really reflect the reality at all. And therefore, uh, we think that it represents a very, very interesting risk report proposition to investors. Great. So Gordon, one of the key areas um, that make up our portfolio in the pre-major income fund, at the moment it's about 50% of the fund is invested in the real estate sector. Obviously we get a lot of questions um, about the sustainability of property and you know, property bubbles and, and all this sort of thing. I mean, it's a really, it's, it's a domestic consumption story. And with COVID-19, how has that impacted the real estate sector? And therefore, has it made an impact, meaningful impact on the bonds that we hold in that, re in that area? Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess uh, I will start with explaining this seemingly high number on a standalone basis that you mentioned, 50, 60%. On a standalone basis, it looks quite high. However, if you really study uh, the, the universe of China high yield bond, you know, uh, for example, you take an index and look at how much property they have in, in the index, uh, you will notice within the China high yield, high yield universe, around 60% of the universe are, are property issuer. Okay? So that means you know, if I own 50 to 60%, we are at best uh, in line with the benchmark. So it's not really overweight. Okay? Uh, so essentially, that means if you invest in Asia credit, you have to buy China. And if you buy China, you have to buy property, you know, you like whether you like it or not. That's the fact, okay? Now, in terms of the fundamental of uh, the, the, the property sector, actually, right now, we are more comfortable. And uh, as you mentioned that the property sector are all domestic. Uh, it does not do any import or export of goods and services, uh, you know, into out of China. 
And that means you know, uh, this single sector will be uh, less impacted by you know, the trade war last year, right? And for COVID-19 this year, uh, luckily speaking, uh, the, the pandemic hit the property sector in a relatively good timing. You know, what, what, what do I mean by that is that uh, uh, property contract sales usually is really, really quiet at the beginning of the year. You know, uh, remember when the uh, pandemic hit, it's actually around Chinese New Year. You know, in China, Chinese New Year, nobody's going to work, right? The whole country is shut down. So uh, in terms of contract sale, it's the same. Nobody buy houses. Right, so 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 the pandemic actually hit the uh, sector in a relatively already very slow season. So the actual impact, although there is some, we expect uh, the uh, contract sales will accelerate second half of this year as the economy restart. And and also in terms of uh, you know the the credit fundamental, if you uh, look at their uh, funding need for uh, this year, 2020s, for example. Uh, because uh, 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 the first two months of 2020 actually was very good for credit market. So the first two months, a lot of the issue actually took the chance to raise the money they need for this year. So if you look at the in terms of their liquidity or refinancing risk, uh, you know, probably right now we're talking about 7 to 75% of that funding is already secure, money in their pocket already. Mm -hmm. So that's really not much sort of short-term liquidity or, 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 or refinancing risk uh, for the entire sector. Uh, so net-net, I think uh, 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 the fundamental are quite good, uh, actually much better than the non-property or so-called industrial sector, you know, which under those sectors, you know, as you can imagine, will be hit quite hardly, uh, uh, first from the trade war last year and also the COVID-19 this year. So, uh, and, and also the, the property sector is actually uh, in line with government policy that, you know, government wants to promote home ownership. And if you believe the uh, middle income class in China is growing, then you know, home ownership is part of the theme. So on balance, we, we think actually quite comfortable, uh, at least uh, uh, on our position in, in the property sector. Fantastic. I mean, the last question um, that I have for you this afternoon is about um, currency hedging. So you have the power as, as the PM of the fund um, to be hedged uh, back into Australian dollars from US dollars. So, so to be clear, the bonds that we hold in the fund are US dollar based. Um, and, and you have that power to, to sort of um, trigger or, or sort of play with that lever. And over time, that has delivered sort of a reduction in overall volatility. Um, and I guess some of those mark to market movements you've seen in, in, in the Asian credit markets we participate in. So can you give us a flavor of where we hedged at right now, sort of why and sort of what level that, that you got us in at for the hedging? Yeah, so right now we are around 60 to 65% hedge back to the Australian dollar. Uh, we were as low as around 10 to 15% uh, during March. And we basically uh, took the hedge up from say 10, 15% to right now 60 to 65% uh, at an average cost of 59 cents uh, uh, on the exchange rate. So, uh, you know, usually, you know, conventional uh, uh, wisdom is, you know, you, you buy hedge when the price is cheap, right? You, you, don't buy, you don't buy your insurance policy when you're about to die, okay? So, 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 so to, to that logic, you know, I, uh, at that point, I think 59 cents on, on the Aussie dollar is actually quite cheap. So we actually, uh, you know, I take out our hedge by paying a small cost of insurance uh, on, on that level. And, and so far, you know, right now, the Aussie dollar is around 63 cents. So for, from that hedge, we make money. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not we're not actively going out there to you know effectively make most of our alpha by currency hedging. That is simply a, an output of um, trying to keep the fund simple, um, keeping the fund just being exposed to USD, which is the most liquid part of the market um, for Asian debt for us. Um, so, Gordon, thanks very much for your time today. Thank you.